Well, thank you very much for inviting me along. Um, we're hoping to show a very short film um, partway through. It's only about six and a half minutes, but due to technical problems, probably my fault, um, Ken has sort of hopefully lashed something up and we should be able to show it. So there'll be a bit of swapping around in the middle, but only for a few seconds. And unfortunately for everybody on the internet, if there is anyone out there actually watching, hi. <laughs> um, <laughs> We can't actually broadcast the film, so sorry about that. You'll actually have about six and a half minutes, maybe an extra minute if it takes us that time to, to get things in place, um, just to do whatever you like. And anyone here, if you want to watch the film, you can have a post-lunch uh, doze. So, um, right. Have I done two? Yeah. Right, so today I'll just give you a little bit of context of what funerary garlands are and... Um, how, how they're found, what actually flowers um, mean in archaeology. Then I'm going to talk um, about some of the theoretical concepts, um, particularly the chain of peritoire and savoir faire and connaissance. Hopefully we'll come and see what they all are. Um, then I'll go through the um, experimental recreation of the garland. And then I'll just, um, depending on how much time we have, just um, speak about some of the research questions that were actually addressed um, by the experiment. So, so um, well, basically, um, plants come under the remit of the archaeobotanist, um, and they tend to just um, concentrate on taxonomy and uh, um, quantification. So they just count what they have and identify it. Um, and the main reason is because, of course, is preservation. You don't get very much plant material preserved in the archaeological record. Okay, sorry. Um, but in fact, in ancient Egypt, of course, we have some quite remarkable preservation, including 3,000-year-old flowers. So, um, some of which you can see here. And this is a garland that I'll actually be talking about later. Um, these are just to show you that wherever you look um, in archaeology, although it's never been given much um, importance, you actually find flowers. And these are just some examples from the Egypt Center. You can see these in the museum. And these are on uh, the special display, display for the um, exhibition, for the conference. And this is just a little cornflower, faience cornflower model. And the mold that, um, not making that particular one, but the stone mold that they would use to make these and they're so realistic that you can actually identify that. This is um, a cornflower species with the blue petals. Um, and of course, there's many, as we're talking about experiment and technologies, there's many plant-based technologies. Um, for example, textiles, barks, gitri, dyes, shipbuilding, all of it, most of which we've actually heard about already, medicines, poisons. Um, then actually there's jewelry, oils, perfumes, and obviously drugs, maybe. Um, and today I'm actually going to be talking the bouquet trees, floral colors, and garlands come more or less under the categories of sort of honoraria and offerings. Um, and they have a meaning, and it's because we're actually modern humans, um, cognitively modern humans, that we can understand what the flowers or what the bouquets um, are actually saying. If somebody gives you a bouquet, you know if they're actually saying happy birthday or sorry you're sick. Or, um, and that's because it's actually a non-verbal means of communication and we have the brain power to understand it and decode the symbols. Um, and I hope eventually that some of the work will actually help push back the barriers back into prehistory, but that's another story. So... Um, that's the garland. Oh, I'm sorry, my finger's a bit heavy. So this is what I mean by, um, this is what I'm actually working on, is the technology use and meaning of arranged plant material. And that's just so that you can see how uh, experimental archaeology sort of will slot into the overall um, project and ideas. And basically, you have here a modern arrangement. Um, this is wreaths and bouquets. This is the honour area, honouring Olympic athletes. Um, that's the British rowing team. Uh, and obviously funerary garlands, and these are like the ones I'll be talking about today. So fresh plant material is taken out of its natural habitat and put somewhere else in order to make a statement. And that's basically flower arranging. 
Um, and it doesn't have to be flowers. It can actually, all foliage is still an arrangement. And it can be any number from one to however much flowers and foliage you want to, um, to make how big the statement is going to be. So, bouquets, wreaths, floral collars and garlands are material cultural objects. They're manufactured using a technological process and as such they can inform us about the technology, the environment, the culture and the beliefs of the people who made them. And you can feed in all sorts of things, which some of which I hope I'll highlight later. So, and most of the um, extant or existing archaeological evidence comes from ancient Egypt. Not quite all, there's tiny, tiny bits elsewhere um, three, four thousand year old flowers, but not broke from recently. Some were found in Scotland from the Bronze Age, but not very much. Most of the material is, is from Egypt, so that's why um, I'm, I'm here today, I guess. So, just to give you some examples, um, I've actually, these are just, um, I'm not going to go into them, um, just some of the, the material that's out there, all from, all from Egypt. And I've actually, in order to sort of study and analyze them, I've formulated a typology based on construction because um, sometimes you can't tell from context and things like that where, where they're from, they're maybe not very well provenanced. So I've done a typology based on, on, on um, construction. Um, and so far I've got about 11 types and there are actually five different types illustrated, um, illustrated there. That's just to give you an overview. And this is the type I'll be talking about today, which I call type 8. So. So this is the funerary garlands. Um, as you can see, this is Tutankhamun. He had funerary garlands. Um, they were in the nested coffins, actually inside. Garlands are off, often in close association with the body. Perhaps the last thing that was put in, it's a symbol of life, because they are still living. The flowers are still, and plants carry on living. They carry on their metabolizing for some time after picking. And I think that's an interesting ideological link with the living and the dead. There's uh, the garlands here. And then this mummy here, this is from the Dale Bari Cache, again with garlands. And this was uh, uh, Moses the first, and this is just an existing sample of, of that garland. And these would have been, this is actually willow leaves, and the flowers here, which are Acacia nilotica, and they are bright yellow. So um, it's really hard to actually try and uh, imagine what they looked like when they were fresh and that's one of the things that actually I got out of the recreation. So just a little bit about the process of a making a flower arrangement for those who don't know and some terminology. So basically you have to start off with your design that's really important it has to be fit for the purpose um, you can see the statue with a garland then you prepare the mechanics um, and the mechanics are actually for this particular garland that's the mechanics so not very attractive. And it's modern foam wrapped in chicken wire to retain water. And you basically poke your flowers in that. It makes a long sausage so it's nice and flexible um, and you can drape it. And then you use the wire and the tools to actually just bind the flowers on. And basically that actually sort of modern technique um, or technique used in modern times, is, 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 um, they used that in ancient Egypt as well. Um, and that one I'm very familiar with, um, but it was that type 8 that I pointed out before. I'd never seen that before used in a modern time at all. Um, and so I was really intrigued by it and really keen to find out how it was, how it was done. And at the bottom, it's just a birth, bunch of birthday flowers just turned into a table arrangement. And um, the, or just about the mechanics, I actually call... Um, the centre, like which is these sausage bits um, that you stick the flowers onto, the central core, and obviously the thing that binds the flowers on is the binding, and I'll, I'll be using those terms. And in Egyptian garlands, all the mechanics are actually plant material as well, because um, obviously they didn't have um, floral foam and various other things. And, and basically you always have, maybe you use tools, there's preparation involved, you always have waste, um, it obviously takes time. You need a workspace. These are the mechanics there for the table arrangement, just the dish and the stuff I'm going to stick the flowers into. Again, so there's always, I say you always need an excess of material because you have to choose and select 
partly for the design and, and um, for other reasons. And then the finished design, and you always have waste. And basically, it's a stepwise progressive process. So how can we look at that sort of archaeologically? Well, um, this is that process almost in more detail. Just to show, really, it's to highlight some of the things that we can then look into and maybe take out of the process. So when you look at the design, for example, um, you need a, the reason why you want that particular garland or arrangement. You need size and color. That might actually have um, belief. That might be part of a belief system. It might be the deceased person's favorite flowers. It might be you didn't like them, so you're actually giving them ones they didn't like. Who knows? Um, they might be really, you might use really expensive things. You know, and this is a sort of like elite idea or just actually a mark of the respect of the person. And you can actually look into all those sort of things when you analyze the garlands. Then you prepare the mechanics. Um, you do that first because um, that's usually the most durable um, part of the arrangement and again I've highlighted most of those. Now just to show you the mechanics in, in the ancient, this is the modern mechanics in the ancient Egyptian, this is what I mean by the core, this is the garland as you can see, leaves and flowers at the bottom and actually there's two strips there of um, date palm leaf, uh, to show that later and then these are the bindings which is how they've actually held the but it's a bundle of a leaf and a flower. And that's actually, um, it's a sort of either a sewing or a weaving technique. And in fact, the, it's, I say not really anyone else is working on this. So there's not really even a terminology. We haven't actually even defined all our terms. You know, so is it sewing? Is it weaving? Is it horticultural? Is it garden, gardening? And so actually I'm making it up as I go along some of the time. But I'll actually, that's, I will be defining all those in, in my thesis, obviously. So then you gather and prepare your plant material um, and you need knowledge and skill, tools, maybe you have to think of cultivation, possibly you've cultivated them um, or eyed them up in the fields previously. Then the most, one of the most important things is actually seasonality. You can't actually put the flowers in unless they're in season and the same with the plants and that's really, really crucial. And the seasonality of the flowers is actually, sometimes it's a very narrow window, it's only a couple of weeks. Um, that they're actually in, in flower. Um, and that's very helpful if you're looking into environmental reconstruction, particularly where you get the garlands and you've got more than one, um, obviously they have more than one species, especially where you get them where there's more than one flower. Uh, I'm not going to talk about those. So you actually have um, what I call co-seasonality and you can actually overlap and, and it, it's actually very, very important. So one of the crucial things on that is actually were they fresh when, when they were used um, because then obviously they were in season and you can, um, that's quite important. So that's one of the things I wanted to look at. And the timing is also important. Do you want the buds open? Do you want them shut? Um, how do you want it to look in the final arrangement? So it's actually quite a complicated process and there's a lot to think of and a lot of um, knowledge and skill that's actually actually needed. And then you make your garland in this case and um, you have artistic ability, maybe fashion or cult the cultural you know, idea of the time comes into it and then you actually use it. Um, and that is actually, as I say, a sequence, a stepwise progressive process. And we actually call that um, or one of the analytical concepts and, and um, sort of analytical uh, techniques or methodology is called the chaine opératoire. And this is for a flower arrangement. This, this is actually just the bit that I've just recently sort of um, just gone over in more detail. As you can see, there's loads of things you can get off or of turn into it, but you can't actually see it. Um, and I'm not going into that today anyway. So basically, the chaine opératoire. <coughs> It's a concept, it was first used by um, Leroy Guran, and actually um, he was a student of Maus, um, Marcel Maus, Maus, is that who you say? You spoke about him yesterday, can't I? And um, he, uh, he had watched Boards, Francois Boards, doing some of the very earliest flint napping experiments. And so, in a way, that's where this whole idea and methodology came from. Um, and then Leroy Guran um, Maus did a, an initial um, 
paper which sort of vaguely mentioned the Shona Peritoire, the idea, but um, Eragoran sort of, uh, what's the word, he actually um, carried on and, and actually sort of formulated it um, much better as a concept and published two books, um, The Guest and the Parole in 60. Four and five, 1964, 1965. So that's where it's coming from. And basically, as I've shown, it highlights the choices made. And if we ask how and why um, for each of the steps, that helps us think about what was needed and also um, to produce the finished artifact. So experimental archaeology <coughs> provides data to help answer some of these questions. Um, so, for example, um, are tools needed? And these are some of the steps that where tools may or may not be needed. Um, so, in fact, now we come into um, ways of knowing and ways of understanding. And I'm, I won't have time to go into the sort of theory of learning and knowledge. And I think um, Willick is going to be talking about skill and apprenticeship um, tomorrow. So I'm not going to go too much into it. Um, two of the terms that were used, um, Hodder was using them in the certainly published in, 80, in 1990, uh, the f we don't have terms in English of actually distinguishing these ways of knowing. We're using phrases, and I think the other lecturers yesterday were, were doing that. But the French use two terms, although if you talk to a French speaker, there's really finite sort of um, uh, meanings. So whether we've actually got the translations right, I'm not 100% sure. Um, but they use connaissance and savoir-faire. And connaissance is actually explicit knowledge. It's the sort of knowledge, um, it's factual knowledge. You can find it in instruction manuals and books. Um, it's sort of linguistic because you can actually tell someone and teach them that way. <coughs> and in fact, um, Pitt Rivers, um, he did some early experiments, as you, uh, experimental archaeology, as you can um, see on the poster. Um, and he actually um, d talked about the intellectual mind and the auto automaton mind. Um, and what he meant by the automaton mind was this sort of idea of savoir-faire and know-how, which is a sort of practical knowledge that you gain by experience, excuse me, um, and maybe ideas of skill and apprenticeship come into it. And it can be learned, but not taught. <coughs> so. Um, as you can see, the classic example is actually right. I mean, we've looked at some really, really skilled, um, I don't know, artisans, craftspeople um, already who've demonstrated things. Um, so it's riding a bike. And you've all you know, been there or perhaps helped children or grandchildren, the worried parent, you know, the child. But you've become this. You know, this is a race, a race, a professional cyclist racing, in fact, at Hearn Hill. So, um, and that's the difference. And then once having mastered, you know, the, the early stages, you can practically ride any bike. Once you know how to ride a bike, you can practically ride any bike. Um, and you don't forget it either. The, and, and they've done mathematical modeling and stuff, trying to, well, but you can't actually, I don't think anyone's actually managed to quantify it. So um, I hope that that's sort of vaguely clear. And it's actually the sort of savoir-faire type of knowledge that you can only really get by doing, and that's where experimental archaeology um, comes into, into play. So let's talk now about the experimental recreation of the garland. Um, and I'm talking, so experimental archaeology had its roots in the later half of the, the latter half of the 19th century. Um, and in fact, at that time, there were a lot of people going out, and there was a lot of um, ethnographic work being done. Um, so, you know, they were seeing people using m more, I, I hate to say primitive, but, you know, um, using natural materials, which in fact in the West we weren't using quite so much. And in fact, basically, um, in terms of theory and understanding of it, I, from what I've, I've read, the literature seems to be that it's actually under theorized, I, but I think sometimes you can have too much theory and it's better just to get on with things. That's my personal view. Um, but in fact, according to Matthau, which was the 2002 paper, um, he, he said, you know, summed up the literature and said 
that actually there wasn't much theoretical literature out there. But in fact, we're beginning to, and not much about, I mean, people were doing things, but more or less in isolation. It's not actually been joined into the main body of archaeology and archaeological theory. That, that, that's my take on it. Um, but now we're beginning to address this, and, and I mean, this conference is a real case in point, and there was one, um, I think, 2007 at Exeter, um, if people know of others, please let me know. I tend to be a bit sort of centred on the UK in my, in my thoughts. Um, and as far as I know, if anyone's interested in reading further, the um, classic sort of text um, is Cole's, John Cole's book from 1979, Experimental Archaeology, and everything that he says is still valid today. And one of the things that he, he did say is that experimental archaeology can provide or deny that vital probability to the conjecture about past human activities. So we don't actually ever really know, um, you know, is this, you know, when you see me folding a leaf or something, is exactly how the ancient Egyptians did it. But the experimental archaeology can give us a really good idea, and it can show us ways that they can possibly have done it because the materials wouldn't have allowed it. So for the recreation of the garland, um, I actually um, had a whole list of questions, really, from having looked at them and, and my analysis of the existing ones. Um, and, but the main problem, this is something I really wanted to try for myself, but the main problem was obtaining the materials. Um, I tried with garden plants, ones that I thought had similar properties to the leaves and flowers used in Egypt, but actually I didn't have very much success at all. I mean, you could vaguely do it, but it was just absolutely hopeless. So um, the problem was actually getting the same species that were available in, in ancient Egypt and used in their garlands. And I was just lucky. Um, I was actually offered the chance um, to uh, make a garland and um, for the, in fact it was uh, BBC were doing a film, at Q, a program at Kew and they wanted to showcase the Economic Botany Collection which is a marvellous collection if, um, for, with resources for natural materials. Um, and so they offered me a chance and I, I thought well if they'll give me the materials um, I'll make a fool of myself, so <laughs> yes. <laughs> So I went ahead. So I had to make a decision. Um, what I had to choose the garland. As I said, I wanted to do this type 8 because I'd never come across it. This is just um, a more complete one, um, just to show you how roughly how they were used. I wanted to handle the species um, for the practical knowledge, the savoir faire. I particularly wanted to use a water lily because I wanted to get my hands on a water lily. One of the reasons being you always or you often see them portrayed like this, sort of bent into the nose. Um, that always intrigued me. Is that realistic, naturalistic, idealistic? Everyone says ritual, but I have my own ideas, which I'll come to. You also see the water lily coiled around these storage jars, and I thought, does the stem actually bend? How is it fixed there? Um, so they were some of the questions. So I actually looked at my data. Um, damaged areas are, will give you lots of, in, uh, is where I got the information from. I'm obviously not going to deconstruct an, a 3,000 year old garland. I don't even touch them. I don't even breathe on them. Um, they're actually very fragile um, because it is dried plant material and it, it does crumble to dust. But they've, once they reach a sort of stasis um, in the environment that they're being curated in, actually that's the best thing to do, just leave them alone. Um, so I drew up my research questions and checked the data um, and the plant availability and then we had to coordinate it and I had to keep saying no it doesn't matter which day um, I'm available all the time it depends when the flower is in flower that's when we have to film it we can't do it any other time that was really hard to get that across um, so so the garland I chose um, partly because it has a good story and I was researching it anyway was the one found on the mummy of Ramesses II. Um, now the mummy had been reburied um, first in KV7, then in KV17, possibly two other times, and was finally reburied in the 21st dynasty in TT320, the Del Bari Royal Mummy Cache. It was rewrapped in the 21st dynasty. I think they're pretty sure on that because of texts on the mummy wrappings. And the assumption was that new garlands were added then. In fact, there's been some really interesting carbon-14 dating, which I can't go into. Um, but anyway, that's another story. And a botanist, German botanist, Schweinfurth, um, identified the plant material and prepared specimen samples. 
so and this is just a, a drawing of the of the plant of the garlands so from the time so and this is it um or what's left that actually is a recreation so don't get your hopes up it wasn't very much we were limited because there was only one water lily so i could only do a tiny bit but i put that there so that you can see how the natural um the fresh material how the colors are compared to the existing bits and um, the, these are in cairo these are in paris or were in the 80s the end of the 70s actually is when they did the work and these are at Kew. I'm pretty sure there's some at Berlin and Leiden as well but I haven't actually seen that so I didn't, I didn't inc include it. So for the, re react the re uh, reconstruction we needed the mechanics in this case date palm here's the garland that I made you can see the central core and the bindings that's the central core made from the leaves date palm leaves and the bindings I needed petals, a water lily, that's them. And in fact, if anyone was awake and noticed, um, the Ramesses garland used Mimusops imperii um, for the leaves. And the one that they, the tree that they had at Kew had mysteriously disappeared. No one could find it. And the resources of the BBC and Kew, they tried various botanical gardens, etc. We couldn't get hold of any in the UK at all. So in fact, I used olive leaves, and I was very happy to do that because there are other garlands, not the Ramesses garland, but other garlands made exactly the same way using water lily and olive. So that was fine. Um, and this uh, olive. So first of all, are we going? Yes. We prepared the mechanics. So the, anyone who watched Joanna Lumley up the Nile, they just actually ran up the tree barefoot in Egypt, a guy, but because he was on a ladder and used a modern knife. Um, this is after a couple of weeks. I was just experimenting. I wondered how they could cut these and were in such uniform widths. I mean, I've measured them in numerous points, you know, as part of my recording process. And it's pretty consistent and they're very, I thought, wow, they're really, really clever. But in fact, when it came to it, um, and partly panicked under filming, I mean, I had my um, Swiss Army knife ready and oh, I didn't, I'm not very good with cutting straight lines so I was sort of panicking but I just literally picked up the leaf I found I could tear it in half and then literally just with my thumbnail tear off a strip and of course they were uniform the only thing was I actually tore them from the middle because on the outside it's curved so you ended up with shorter and shorter pieces and that actually explained it's actually um, you know maybe this long the one I had when you're sewing, you know, the length of thread is actually, you, you don't have it too long, but you don't want it too short either. And so um, these were okay. And it's, have I moved it? No. And explained why there were actually um, quite a lot of knots. I was wondered why there were knots and things in the process. So that was it. And you can see the core and the binding being woven there. So then I prepared the olive leaves. Really the thing to take into that um, this is uh, experiments after a couple. It just shows you um, the different sizes and types of leaves that are available on just one branch. So the selection is actually quite important. You see different shapes here, different sizes. Out of that packet, which I did on the day of the filming, this sort of, I think it was 53. I'm sorry, I should have checked the numbers. Um, I actually got about eight that were what I wanted. Um, so um, I haven't done the stats yet. Then I fold, folded them up and the leaves were there. So that's that. And then we come on to the petals. So I'll pick the water lily, talk about that later. Pulled off the petals, very sad. <laughs> I really found that hard to do as a person who loves flowers. Um, that's what it looks like. It had wilted quite a bit. Um, we had to pick it about six hours before I used it, which I would not have done that in choice. You can see the yellow centre, which will has the, you all know more about that than me. This is a cross-section of the stem. I mean, that was very familiar to a lot of designs that they, they use. Um, and then that's folding it. Um, and then when I started off making my huge length of garland, um, it, it sort of unravels as you go along. I wasn't sure how they would do it. I thought I might have to, I needed a third hand. Did they attach it? Um, I remember watching uh, Willeka's... Um, a basket weaving video and um, that the guy actually uses his foot as almost a third hand to stabilize the work that he's, he's doing so I thought well, I'll take my shoes off you know so 
But no, in fact, all I did was actually I just tied it all together and tied it to the base. And it was actually that worked. And now that I've done that as part of the experimental process, I should go back and look at the garlands and see if I can see something similar or the way that it was fastened off. So and I, that's something else out of it. So um, having done the garland, um, during the process, I mean, there's a really long list, um, I was asking um, a lot of questions of the material. Some I thought about, especially dur during the recreation, some actually um, before, some whilst I was um, doing my uh, earlier work. But I'm obviously not, some of them I've actually already covered, um, and I'm happy to talk about this to anyone um, afterwards. But for now, I'm just going to go, um, in the time that's left, I'll, I'll talk about wrong, wrong button. I'll talk about just three, three of them. And that was evidence that plants were fresh and locally sourced. That's really quite important for um, environmental reconstruction, for example, um, and also carbon dating. That has um, been very interesting. Um, and then I looked into how was the material gathered. You know, I mean, I knew, um, the plants are specific. I mean, know yourself if you pick different flowers or, or so in the garden, the way that you actually pick, um, for example, a daffodil or a rose, it's actually quite different, maybe even different tools that you would use and, and how you would do them. Um, and uh, also then the final one was how, how do water lilies behave after picking? And does this give insights in regarding the graphic representations of the water lily in ancient, um, in ancient Egyptian? From ancient Egyptian art, I really meant. <laughs> Um, or ancient Egypt, sorry about that. So, um, and that goes back to the um, question or the discussion that we had yesterday, which Martin did with the flint mapping. You know, are they, are they realistic um, when it's technological? And Willika joined in on that with her basketry. And I, I actually, you know, had almost wondered about the same point, but felt that maybe I was, you know, pushing the boat out. But, um, I think, um, no, maybe we will get some evidence and we can stack it up and make a case. That would be quite nice. But they weren't always ritual and um, idealistic. So um, the first question was a plant material fresh and locally sourced. And I actually, I like to think I can make a good argument, a very good argument for that, which um, is very reasonably acceptable. Um, I can't actually go into all the um, data and all the... Um, reasoning uh, now for a that's a whole lecture effectively um, but um, this is a garland virtually as I finished making it um, a little bit later and this is the one to, to look at actually that it, this shows what I mean really um, if you can see these are the ol fresh olive leaves and this is five days later in fact actually by the end of the sort of filming process which was actually only a few hours later that you can't see that they're so coiled and, and dried there. But even a few hours later, they were unusable um, because they, weren't, they had dried out a little bit. They had actually coiled up, and there was no way I could straighten them. I actually even tried putting them in water and various things like that. Um, and they weren't flexible, so you actually couldn't bend them and keep them in position. So if you can compare these coiled up leaves with these effectively flat leaves which were picked at the same time and it's actually the, that's why I say the mechanics is so important, it's actually the core and the, the binding, the mechanics that's held the garland exactly how you want it and held the leaves in place. Um, and this is after two years, I think now actually it's after four, it doesn't look much different. It's actually, it's, it's nowhere near so supple, um, it's, it's, but it's, I can still handle it, I've still got it. I, I, thought to bring it today, but actually, to be quite honest, I just couldn't carry anything else, <laughs> um, you know, with the laptop and everything else. So um, that's just one tiny um, thing, and that has a lot of good inferences, particularly, as I say, the carbon-14 data was very interesting. So um, another question was, how were the plants gathered? Well, this just shows papyrus. I didn't put papyrus in the garland. I hope people are awake enough to realize that. But one of the ones that I showed earlier, um, they did use papyrus as some of the binding material and the core. Um, this actually was a, just a tiny little bit part of a bigger garland, and that's papyrus and a papyrus binding. Now that's not so regular. Um, it's quite flexible. I wasn't even sure 
um, like the leaf, the date palm leaf. I wasn't. I knew it was date palm leaf because that had been botanically identified by people whose identification I um, trust. But um, I didn't know which part of the leaf. I didn't actually even know what a date palm leaf looked like until I went to Kew. And that's, you know, why I put the picture for anyone else who's not, you know, you can see the size of it. You can see the bits um, that, that were actually used. So I wanted to get my hands on some papyrus, and they had it growing in Kew at the time. So I said I wanted papyrus, so I did. And actually, this is just um, a, a painted plaster picking and peeling papyrus. Um, you see the guy using his put here as a third hand, effectively, to steady it. And um, this is the picking bit, which corresponds to this. And it wasn't until I actually was putting this together and going over it, I realized that my standing position is virtually the same. You can't actually see the bent knee there. But, um, and that actually was to brace myself. It was, you know, you saw on the film, it's the sort of thing, and I didn't want to, you know, fall over. And that's just a natural, and that's one of these things that over time, you know, from childhood, We've learnt. You probably don't even realise you do it. You brace yourself on the tube, or um, and that, that's one of these sort of savoir faire type knowledges. And if you can also see the flathead, it bends and breaks down here. Um, I don't know if you noticed that waving about in the film. Um, the shipbuilding film, when they picked it for the prow um, to finish off the prow, the stems had actually all fallen down and bent. Well, if you're peeling great lengths and you want a straight length. You actually don't want it then because that compresses the cells and then you've changed the physical and the chemical properties, more likely to decay things. I can't quite go into that, but that's what happens. So and actually you can see, I mean, I didn't. I was just using you know, two hands and a bit of force um, to, to actually pick it. Um, but the, you know, the supposed professional um, ancient Egyptian papyrus picker, he's got his one hand there and the other one is, is more or less bra bracing the flower and keeping it straight. So... I think possibly that is um, a realistic portrayal. Um, and then we come to gathering water lilies. Um, this, these are just uh, painted tomb scenes, which are in the Met. These are copies, I believe. There's a whole wall of them, and I'm sorry I couldn't remember which exactly one this is. I was so excited to see it. Um, I didn't actually make a note. Um, and it's just this it's sort of hunting scene on the Nile. Um, and it's just this little area here, and as you can see, the two, the two hands of the girl in the boat, um, she's got them like this, and that was exactly the, uh, all right, no, one, one one way, one the other way, um, like this. And that was exactly the way that I had to pull it. In the film, you saw me using uh, secateurs, and that's because I didn't want to really risk damaging the only <laughs> water lily, because otherwise there wouldn't have been any garland. Um, but in fact, I had practiced on, there were a couple of dead buds, and I practiced on those, and also on a leaf which had a similar vascular, one of the, the water lily leaves, similar vascular structure. Um, and, you know, one hand, two hands, various positions, and actually the, um, the way I worked it out, that seemed it, and so I was quite excited when I saw this. Um, and, or maybe I'd seen it and, and it was in my subconscious, um, because actually I went to the Met the year before I did the thing. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm not actually, um, so I think very realistic, and I think people who do wildlife and things like that, they can actually identify these, you know, the birds and the animals from, from the paintings, and you can do that with quite a lot of the plants as well. So that's that one. Um, and then the final, my final um, uh, s slide really, are, are depictions of the water lily symbolic, stylistic, or realistic? Um, here we go back to uh, Ramesses II mummy, and here are just individual um, water lilies just put into the bindings. You can see the stems are straight, um, like these. This was quite often done, sometimes just the flower heads, but mostly with the stem attached. Um, the length of the stem is obviously dependent on, I would say, um, the depth of the water, because they grow from the bottom up. Um, so, you know, that was, I measured the water in queue and, you know, took temperature, things like that. Um, so, and this is from the child burial, the one I showed you the pretty, um, in, in the Met um, earlier. Um, it also had in a garland and individual flowers, much like um, Ramesses II. Um, and then this is a thing I mentioned about the uh, water lily stem being held in that position 
to the nose. This is just an example, which is in the Egypt Centre, so you can actually go and see it. If you go into the bottom galleries and keep walking right to the end, it's on the far wall. Um, and this is another example from the Petrie Museum. I mean, there are numerous. Um, I've started making a collection of sec what I call secondary sources, but I think that's another project in itself. That's how they actually grow with upright straight stems. Um, but in fact, this was in fact six hours after picking it. This isn't a scientific um, thing. It was just that we picked it in the morning because we had to film um, when the water lily house before the public were there because otherwise we wouldn't have been allowed inside it. Um, and then we did the actual doing later on on what was actually the hottest day of the summer. In fact, the hottest day we've had in the UK for a long time. It was so hot they keep the water lily on the water at 25 degrees. And it was cool. It was lovely being wading in there. Um, it was cool even through the waders, so it was hot. Um, and just another one. Yeah, I think. So I, I, I just, th I think that's. Um, so to me, that's not ritual. That's just how the water lily head droops. Um, other flowers do the same. Irises, things like that. They, they, they just droop. Um, so that's 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 it really. So thank you very much. Um, and. Um, I guess if there's, I don't know if there's time for questions. Cause, yeah. Thank you very much, Sally. Yes, we have yeah. questions yeah. in this one up front. So, oh, sorry. Yes, and I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm actually quite deaf. So if I, you know, if I answer the wrong question, it might be that I haven't heard you. It might be that I don't know the answer. Um, but equally, um, maybe I need to fill this. I'll, so, I'll um, repeat yeah? the question. Yeah. Sally, um, presumably it wouldn't matter if you're going to wrap up a, um, make a funerary garden. It might be prepared, you know, a couple of hours or an hour before it would put around the body. Um, so it doesn't matter that the that lotuses um, might not have survived. I, I think so. No, I don't think that's actually. I don't think that's the case because um, I can't uh, actually show you, but if you look at the ones that are um, the ex existing garland bits that are left, the petals are flat. Um, whereas if you remember the sort of brown or well, bluey brown bits in the garland, by the time I'd finished it, finished handling it, bearing in mind I had no skill with handling the petals, so I wanted to touch and use a water lily. I didn't know what happened to it. And are familiar with other flowers, but not that. So I, I don't think so. No, I think they make them pretty, pretty fresh, um, and um, or they were much more skilled than me. So th there is a slight. The petals are sort of slightly waxy. I think they would stand up and hold for a, a few hours, yes. But I, I don't know how long. Um, but, and that's, you know, my down to my lack of skill with handling the plant. Um, so that's further experimentation. But certainly you couldn't do it like, I mean, like that sort of garland, flower garland, or if you have a similar wedding garland, the one that was on the statue, you can, you, nowadays you can make those up a few days, a day, two days or so beforehand, and sometimes you even put them in cold storage. Um, but I don't think they could do that in Egypt, no. That's why I, ha I had the idea of the fresh um, and locally sourced. One more question. Oh, sorry. Uh, you mentioned about uh, the wrapping around the glasses. Yes. So were the stems flexible than they did? Yes. Yes. I did actually. I did actually do that. Um, I uh, didn't even get a photo because the stem length that we had was actually quite short. And the only thing I, t I did actually ask um, a if I could have um, some stone tools, you know, to practice cutting with. I thought that was a big no. Um, and also, you know, I wanted a storage jar. They had some nice ones in the Peachy Museum, but that was a big no as well. Um, and so, in fact, I used a plastic flower pot because that was just handy on the shelf behind me in queue. And it did coil around. I couldn't actually see how it would fasten. But, um, and there's no evidence of fasting. I even actually wondered whether you could, um, but you could train the plant to grow up around the vase. Um, but it, it kept its coil for a little while when I uncoiled it, um, but not for very long. It did straighten again. So you would have needed some sort of way of fixing them or... Yeah, I, I, it needs more experimentation, but you could certainly coil it and it st stayed in place. Yes. Um, yeah. Is there a possibility that the uh, garlands could have perhaps been pressed and dried to maintain their shape and colour? 
be taken the shape of? Is there a possibility that the gardens could maybe be pressed and dried to maintain their shape and colour for longer? Um, yes, in fact, actually, a lot of uh, it depends on the species um, they, and how long the colour actually retains its um, it keeps. Um, they actually the the accounts of discovering gardens in, in various tombs, they actually say, and they even talk about the fresh, the smell of some of them, but they actually say that they retain the colour. How true that is, I don't know. All the specimens I've seen now have been faded and, and brown. Um, I have got some flowers I've just dried myself, um, in fact, cornflower, um, and they still have a blue colour in them, and that was now, since 2001, I did those. I picked those and did those. Um, and they've just been on a bookcase at home. Um, but um, they are still fairly fair. I'm saying I haven't actually handled them, but in fact I've watched um, occasionally a curator or someone else touch them, um, usually as I'm panicking in the background and saying, please don't. Um, but uh, there is vague evidence that maybe they were reused, um, but the carbon-14 data is just too inconclusive. So this one other question. In that case, I'd like to give Sally another round of applause, and thank you very much. Thank you.